The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of Your Included, theologian Dr. Gary Detto discusses the identity of God and the true meaning of repentance. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fizell. Thanks for joining us again. It's a privilege to be here. If uh, everyone is included in the love and uh, grace of God, then why do we have to struggle so hard to uh, obey God? Well, that in inclusion, of course, is inclusion in a relationship. If we remember who this God is, is God is revealed in Christ is a communion and fellowship of three divine persons in, in God. God himself is a fellowship, a being together, uh, where there are real relations, knowing and glorifying and loving one another, Jesus tells us, from all eternity. God's being is a fellowship and a communion. His salvation for us is also a being in communion and fellowship. Uh, this is why we can say God is love in his own being, and we were created for loving purposes. Salvation is fellowship and communion with God. Um, so when we're saved, uh, or we, we receive the mercy of God, we're saved into a relationship so that we have our being by being in relationship with God. We have our being by belonging to God through Christ. Obedience is just living along the grain of that relationship. Uh, it's receiving that unconditional grace, but then responding appropriately to that grace with repentance, with faith and hope and love, uh, with thanksgiving. So God's inviting us into salvation as he's inviting us into a real relationship with God. And that calls for our response and participation. So we're united and belong to Christ in order to participate with Christ and in Christ. So living the Christian life is not just a matter of keeping a list of rules, some arbitrary list that God came up with in order to uh, have something to measure us with. It has to do with an actual relationship. Yes, he's calling us into a relationship has a certain structure to it. To be loving, you have to do loving things. Uh, to have a free exchange of knowing, of receiving, back and forth, uh, requires a, an order and a structure that's built into the nature of the relationship itself. In our case, we're in a, a loving covenant relationship with God where he gives us all of who he is and what he is, and then we receive it, and furthermore, we pass it on to others. So it's the demands, not of the law, but as the nature of a uh, loving, glorifying relationship with God. Uh, we do get confused. We, we think um, that often God has the, an arbitrary list of, of rules, things that he just wants done. Um, whereas God enters into a covenant, he says, I am for you in Christ. Uh, Paul says, all things in Christ are yes, God's yes to us and amen. But there are, in that grace, there are not conditions to receive the grace, but as James Torrance, who I studied with, likes to say is, there are the obligations of grace itself, that is to receive it, to give thanks back, and to pass it on to others. And in some ways, yes, you could describe a life filled with that grace and that giving and receiving proper to it. You could describe it uh, as some kind of, you know, rules. You could say, well, it looks like this, it looks like that. You could make a list from it, but the list could never be exhaustive, and it never shows you the true heart of the relationship. So, uh, yes, we're invited into a relationship that has a shape, a very definite shape, um, and our essential response is faith, hope, and love. We obey by faith, hope, and love, um, not out of just obligations to arbitrary rules. In a relationship with your spouse, you wouldn't uh, take out a list in the morning or even the, even the commandments 
and say to yourself, well, all right, now I, today I want to have a decent relationship with my wife, so uh, I won't, I, I must remember not to steal from her, mm, mm. and I, I can't, I, I shouldn't kill her, <laughs> and uh, that, uh, you don't, that isn't how it works. The, yeah. When you're in the relationship, a loving relationship, there's a, there's a desire to do that which is good and which enhances the relationship as opposed to uh, just taking out a static list of rules. So that would lead us to then, okay, what's the point of the, of the Ten Commandments then? If, if indeed the commandments are uh, fulfilled in Christ and in our lives as we are in Christ, then what was the point of the Ten Commandments in the first place? And how do they, how do they apply to us as Christians as opposed to how they apply to the Israelites? Well, I think we can see uh, pretty clearly the place of the, those commandments and Leviticus and, and all. As, as you remember, uh, Paul even reminds us, is the covenant came first. The law didn't come till 430 years later. That can hardly mean that the law is first. In other words, God creates a covenant relationship very much like a marriage where he commits and promises things freely for the sake and the favor and the benefit of his beloved. So God makes a covenant with Israel and with Israel on behalf of the world. He makes a covenant. He offers a promise. You say on behalf of the world, meaning? That Israel was to be a light to the world so that they might come and know the same God that Israel knew. They were a servant people. They were a, a, a people with a mission. Now, of course, so often in their history, they forgot that they were, but they were meant to be a channel of blessing. Abraham certainly knew this, a channel of God's blessing uh, to others. Um, so the covenant is established. I, and the simplest way we find in Scripture repeated throughout is, I will be your God and you shall be my people. And God is going to use all his godness, if you can put it that way, to bless his people. God chose Israel in order to be a blessing to them. But the greatest blessing was for them to pass that blessing on to others. Um, so uh, now, as he has that covenant relationship uh, with them, there are the obligations of grace. In other words, to live in the covenant where uh, God will be their God and they shall be his people. Um, so to live in that relationship, yes, there are the obligations of that graciously given relationship. Now, that comes to be, for the help of Israel, described as laws. If you're in a loving relationship, if you're counting on God uh, to give you all his promises, you will live a life of receiving that blessing like this and like that and like the other. So you can list the ways, you see, but those ways don't establish the covenant. Uh, nor do those ways break the covenant. God has freely given his covenant to bless, and that is very much, again, like a marriage where you promise freely uh, out of who you are uh, to bless the other, and God does the same with us. So our fulfilling the conditions uh, don't create the covenant, our not fulfilling the conditions don't break the covenant, but they do create a rocky relationship. And that's what you see in the history of Israel, a rocky relationship when Israel resists the covenant and therefore and refuse to be the channel of God's blessings to others. So there are consequences to resisting the covenant that can be described as breaking the laws. For many of us, it's as though we have a relationship with the law first and God is just kind of the arbitrator of the law or the sheriff or the enforcer or something but we we sense that we have that our real job is to keep this law happy and we get upset if we're not keeping the law happy and but it it changes the nature of of the relationship from god to the law yes i think uh, many are caught in that exact trap and i was myself uh, as well it leads to burnout in the christian life uh, Yes, if, if we start thinking that God is at a great distance from us and that, as it were, he hands over to us just a law and rules, 
such that we don't really know the heart of God, the mind of God, see, but we have his rules. So then the, the, the law itself mediates the relationship rather than seeing is, no, it is Christ himself by the Spirit who mediates the relationship. He is the one true mediator who brings us into the very presence of God and who brings God to us in his own presence with us by the Spirit. So he is the mediator. This is why Jesus can say is, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I created the Sabbath. I know what it's about. Don't you tell me what the Sabbath is about. I'll tell you what the Sabbath is about. And I myself am your Sabbath rest. I myself. Um, So yes, when we uh, forget the covenant and forget who God is, the law can intervene and now there's a and become its own mediator instead of, no, it is Jesus is the one who takes us to the Father and brings the Father to us all in the power of the Spirit. There's a passage in Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 that reads, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. How can we say that all are reconciled now, uh, the question is asked, if indeed some will be Uh, raised to shame and everlasting contempt? Well, I think that's a a descriptive uh, passage that's describing what might or what could happen, and it's a warning uh, passage uh, in the end so that that doesn't happen. But there is a a warning. Now here it's important to remember what the object of uh, God's wrath and judgment is. The object is sin in his creatures who belong to him, created in Christ, Paul tells us, through Christ and for Christ. We all bear the image through our creation, uh, the image of the Son uh, in us. So the God's wrath, the object of God's wrath and God's judgment is that which destroys uh, his good purposes and his good creation, most including us. God is against the evil that destroys his good creation. Uh, And he's never going to change his mind about that. Never. Um, God is implacably opposed to that because it ruins his relationship uh, with creation and creation's relationship with him. And so when God's wrath comes upon us, it's coming down to do what? To get rid of the sin in us. Now, if it weren't for Christ and God's wrath came down upon us, in order to get rid of the sin in us, we would die in our sins. But because the wrath of God, implacably opposed to all uh, evil, comes down on Christ, one with God and one with us, the result is the evil is done away with. Evil has no future. It is done away with in Christ, and we are set free from it. So we are saved. But our sins are not saved. God is not perpetuating the sin. But us, cut apart from our sin. One of the meanings of forgiveness in the New Testament is to send away, is to separate away. God separates it. So when God's judgment comes, uh, and it will always come, against that which ruins and destroys his creation, but when it comes in Christ, is we are rescued from it. This particular passage is imagining people who somehow somehow would resist God's work of separating us from our sin. And if it's possible for some to do that to all eternity, that is to cling to their sin so tightly and to resist the work of of God in their place and on their behalf in Christ, um, that yes, what what will happen to their sin and the evil in them may also happen to them if they can manage to cling to their sin. But in repentance and confession, in dying to self and living to Christ, we say, we don't say to God, okay, make an exception about the sin in my life. We say is, you're right, it's wrong, kill it, get rid of it, get it out of my life once forever. I don't ever want to see it again. And God says, yes, I will. So he condemns the sin, but rescues and saves the sinner. And that is the good news. Might some people figure out how to hang on to that sin? Uh, I guess it's a possibility, but that's the very possibility that Christ has come 
to see that it never happens. So often we, we tend to think uh, we're not, because, because we sin, especially when, when we sin in an overt way that we're uh, struck with it and discouraged because of it, we tend to think we're not worthy mm -hmm. of the grace of God. We're not worthy of God's presence in our lives. And yet the very reason Christ did what he did is to deal with that very sin that we think we can't come to him because we're not worthy to come to him. Yes, I think we very much can be caught in that trap of thinking or we're worthy. Sometimes we talk about, uh, you know, uh, meriting. Um, but we were never worthy. It was never God's intention throughout all of Scripture for human beings to somehow work up their own righteousness. Now, the Apostle Paul figured this out. It was never God's intention for us to have our own righteousness that then God would reward uh, from all eternity. Righteousness only comes from God. The only way to receive righteousness, to have righteousness, is to receive it. So this is why Paul doesn't count counts all his righteousness as nothing. Because the only real righteousness is that which is given as a gift and received by faith. So it was never intended to be merited either in the Old Testament or the New. Uh, the righteousness is a gift to be received by repentance and faith from God. Um, so it was never about merit, it was never about earning or rewarding. It never was and it never will be. And so it's received uh, as a gift from first to last. Now that takes us right back to the beginning uh, of what we were talking about. If, if you actually trust God to forgive you and to cleanse you from all sin and, and you the question all again comes up, well, um, it, that's too easy. It's too easy to just um, know God has forgiven you and to trust that he is still on your side and, and uh, cares for you. Uh, so doesn't that encourage you to just keep on sinning instead of encourage you not to sin? Well, again, if, if sin is just violating an arbitrary rule, certainly, yes. It, see, if grace is an exception to a rule, this is often, we think about grace periods, you see, or I teach sometimes, and so, you know, I'll be gracious and the student won't have to turn it in on time. Mm -hmm. we, all, we often think that grace is the exception to the rule. No, grace is not an exception to any rule. God doesn't overlook the sin. The sin has to be done away with. When we receive God's mercy, what we're doing is living in his light, living in his love. And that has a shape and even we could say an obligation, the obligations of love. So we stay in that center. We stay in the light. We stay re receiving from God all that he has uh, for us. And when we sin, we offer it up in repentance for him to do away with it and renew and restore us. So, so we really want to stay in that renewed and restored relationship, uh, and that requires effort. But it's the effort of faith and hope and love, you see, uh, trusting in God to continue to provide us and renew us and restore us over and over again. So it doesn't lead to laziness or laxness uh, at all. It leads to a vibrancy and fullness to want to remain in the very center, in the heart of that relationship where we're receiving from God everything he offers us. So there is a kind of a discipline and an order and a structure, but it's the order and structure of a right relationship with God and wanting to stay in the middle. I mean, an analogy here would be to say, what, what is the point of people becoming married? Because if you're married, then there's no point in them living together. Well, no, it's the exact opposite. The point of being married and declaring those covenant promises one to another is in order to live together. And it is the same of living in the center of God's covenant uh, with us that takes all the energy and creativity and faith and hope and love in God that we have. There's no laziness in it at all. In many ways, it's, the question doesn't even make sense. To, if if God loves you and, and has forgiven you, therefore, 
um, why should you go out of your way to, uh, to live a Christian life, doesn't make sense because when, if, if you love God, you're, you're not oriented in the direction of that question. Our typical response to such lavish grace seems to be uh, that it overwhelms us. We, we, we think, how can such a thing be? There must be some, uh, it, it's like we, we have such a need to get a little of our own righteousness in there and, and let that righteousness be worth something rather than receiving the good things God has for us. Yes, it is. It does put us in a position of humility. Um, that is the humility to receive all God's goodness and that he freely gives us. And sometimes that does make us nervous so that we want to go back into a contractual relationship with God where if I, God, then you uh, do this because it creates a false sense of security that if we need God to love us, all I need to do is this and then he will. But if I'm not so interested in God and I kind of want to go off and do my own thing, I can just be disobedient for a while. Um, that gives us the sense of being in control, which of course we're not. But yes, it is a humility to live is God is loving in his own being and extends that to him. So what he's calling me to is to uh, receive from him uh, daily. And it is a matter of humility to receive him and realize I don't control it. I can't earn it. I can't even dis-earn it. It is the reality behind who God is and who I am uh, and who he is towards me. So yes, it calls for a continual humility of receiving, but it shouldn't lead to insecurity because this God is faithful. And of course, we see that faithfulness in Jesus Christ from beginning to end, from birth to crucifixion, to life, to ascension, continuing to intercede for us for all eternity. God is for us. So yes, we can't control God, but the good news is we don't have to control God. God, out of the fullness of his own triune being, is loving and merciful towards us and does not need to be contracted with or bargained with or manipulated or pressurized. God himself being himself, as it leads to that love and security. And sin, of course, carries its own consequences because that's what makes it sin. If you, uh, if you put your foot in the lawnmower, then it'll cut your foot. And so you want to avoid doing that, just as we want to avoid sin, because it does have negative consequences, which is why Christ came to deliver us from a life that produces negative consequences. Absolutely. Yes. If we resist the grace of God, um, it'll have consequences. The consequences aren't that we will change God's love into God's hate. No. I've, I've used this image before, is that uh, if you know anything about sailing, and I used to sail a bit, uh, sailing with the wind is an extraordinary experience of the wind blowing behind you, the boat going with the boat, the waves are going with the boat. It's calm. If the sun's out, it's warm. It's silent, but you're moving through the water, sometimes at tremendous speeds. It's a wonderful experience. But you know, uh, if you need to turn around and go back the other direction, or even at a 90 degree angle to that, in just a moment as the boat turns very quickly, um, everything changes. The sail is now flapping and making all kinds of noise. There's all of a sudden wind. And uh, the, the water now, you're going against the waves that are blown by the... Uh, by the winds. The water is splashing on you. You're getting wet. You're getting cold. You would think you're in a different ocean at a different time in a different place. You see, but what has changed? The direction of the wind, the warmth of the sun, uh, the direction of the waves? No, you've changed. So yes, when we resist the mercy and grace of God, it resists us. There are consequences. But the consequence is not we can get the wind and the sun and the waves to change. They continue to blow against us. Why? Because God is with his breath and with his wind blowing us into the very center of his own heart. So yes, there are consequences, uh, but they cannot undo who God is, what God has done for us in Christ. Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. 
And that's got to be a journey that all of us are on, uh, each in our own individual way as God draws us toward himself. And yet the whole purpose is to get to the place where there, we're in that uh, the right configuration with the wind and the, and the waves uh, that you're describing and instead of contrary wise to it. And when we are, we begin to reap those benefits of being in right relationship with God. Yes, that's exactly right. When we uh, participate uh, is an important New Testament word. When we have fellowship and communion with God, then everything God gives us, we receive and it blesses us and enables us to deal with difficulties that we face. Um, it reminds us of God and enables us to treat our neighbors uh, in a loving and forgiving way. So yes, all the benefits flow through us then to us, and through us. Uh, when we resist that, we're gumming up the whole works. I mean, another simple image could be is we're putting water in the gas tank of, of this vehicle that takes us to Christ and to live in his very heart. So yes, and God is not interested in seeing us go through that, much like parents watching their children resist good things from time to time. So God wants us to live in the fullness of that relationship even now, uh, to its fullest. And that's not something that we can bring about or do ourselves and just get ourselves in that configuration. Well, the amazing thing about the grace of God, it's not only God coming towards us and offering a relationship, but by His Spirit uniting us to Christ, enabling us to respond. So our responses are also a gift that we receive by faith. We're both saved by faith or justified by faith in the good working of God, but also we're sanctified by the good working of God. God grows us up, God transforms us, and gives us Christ's own spirit so that, yes, our responses are actually a gift of God that Jesus himself as our high priest mediates to the Father graciously, transforming them, perfecting them, and offering them back to God as if they were his. So he is the great mediator that brings the things of God to us, but he also takes our responses and mediates them to the Father, the dual mediation of Christ. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.